And so with that, let's turn a little bit uh, to TDM1, which we've talked about a little bit, and I'll just kind of summarize uh, kind of with some baseline uh, factors with this. Uh, TDM1 uh, is an anti-HER2 antibody, uh, which is bound to a microbial tubule inhibitor and tansine. Uh, it's indicated uh, for single-agent therapy uh, for the treatment of HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer following recurrence after treatment with trastuzumab and ataxane, uh, either separately or in combination. And there are several studies uh, that have been uh, presented or in progress. Uh, there's TERESA, uh, which is a study of trastuzumab and tansine in com uh, comparison uh, with physician's choice of treatment uh, in HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer patients who have received at least two prior regimens of HER2-directed therapy. Uh, the study uh, is ongoing uh, with TDM1 being compared to the investigator's choice in third-line therapy or beyond. Uh, this study has been presented in preliminary fashion uh, at the uh, uh, fall European uh, breast cancer meetings. Uh, a very exciting trial, Marianne, uh, which is a study of trastuzumab and tansine, TDM1, plus pertuzumab uh, or pertuzumab and placebo uh, versus trastuzumab plus ataxane in patients with metastatic breast cancer. This is an ongoing trial, uh, which really I believe, and I think all of us here probably share this opinion, uh, that it's going to set the standard of care for first-line treatment for metastatic breast cancer. Um, I think, uh, again, this is a trial of standard trastuzumab-based therapy uh, versus TDM1 uh, versus TDM1 and pertuzumab. Unfortunately, in the Marianne trial, uh, there's no arm of THP, uh, but I think that just was uh, just the way it was designed. It was before Cleopatra uh, was announced. Um, the final trial, and I have one of the PIs of the trial sitting next to me here, uh, is Amelia, uh, which is an open-label study of trastuzumab and tansine versus capecitabine lapatinib uh, in patients with HER2-positive locally advanced or metastatic breast cancer. Uh, this is an ongoing open-label study uh, with some very significant results reported, uh, and by every measure used, uh, TDM1 had a greater efficacy and less toxicity uh, than combined lapatinib and capecitabine. Uh, PFS was significantly longer with TDM1, uh, 9.6 months versus 6.4 months. Um, with a hazard ratio of 0.65, which was significant. Uh, median overall survival was also significantly longer with TDM1, uh, 30.9 months versus 25.1 months with lapatum capecitamine, also a fairly substantial hazard ratio with a significant p-value. So actually, I'll start with Kim. Um, what do you think of the new trial designs that are being used to study pertuzumab uh, and TDM1? Sure. So within the metastatic setting, I don't think you, you um, can underestimate the importance of the Marianne study. I think it will set a standard of care for the person, the patient who's just facing newly diagnosed metastatic or recurrent HER2-positive breast cancer. And I think we're all anxiously awaiting whether or not adding pertuzumab, which has, has been shown to have efficacy in combination with trastuzumab, will add something on top of TDM1. So Marianne asked a very basic question, which is our old friend, taxane trastuzumab, can we do better with either TDM1 or TDM1 plus pertuzumab. And I think until we have those results, what data we have is that both in Amelia and in Teresa, that TDM1 should be the go-to agent above what we would have done before the introduction of TDM1. Teresa proves its efficacy in the third line setting. Amelia proves its efficacy compared to what we would have gone to probably before TDM1 was available, which is lapatinib and capecitabine. And I think with those Three trials, uh, Marianne outstanding, Amelia and Teresa really suggest that TDM1 should play a major role in the treatment of HER2-positive trastuzumab refractory metastatic breast cancer. Any comments? Hope? Um, you know, I think we were very impressed with TDM1 uh, in the phase two trials. We participated in the first two, I guess the phase two trials that looked first in patients whose cancers were progressing on trastuzumab. And then this, you know, attempt to get accelerated approval in patients who had progressed on five different regimens, anthracyclines, taxanes, capecitabine, trastuzumab, and lapatinib. And uh, in that group, compared to the first, we saw the same, about 30% uh, response rate. But what was really remarkable to me was that, you know, I had patients who didn't respond, patients who had short-lived responses. But there were a few patients in my practice, one of whom still is on treatment, who stayed on for more than three years. Now, after they progressed, they didn't have a whole lot of options for treatment. But I think, and notably, pertuzumab combinations didn't work. But uh, those patients, I think, may have, ha may have taxane resistance when they progress on TDM1, not all. Uh, but one of them is still on and is almost four years into it. So it is clearly a very interesting agent with modest toxicity. 
that we have no idea who responds to other than they have HER2-positive disease. And that would be a great task. Yeah, we have any, do we forward. have any bio? I mean, as she was teeing you, you up, do we have problem. any biomarkers for this? <laughs> Can you yeah, fix that problem, please? There was a panel please? of biomarkers <laughs> in the paper that uh, Jose Bosalga and, and a group of us presented at the ASCR. Um, but the only thing that really stood out was the Piaget kinase uh, right. mutational Thanks. data. Um, uh, and also, um, in some of the other TDM1 trials, uh, the level of HER2 expression probably actually is important, no surprise there. Uh, but apart from that, it's been uh, rather disappointing, the campaign looking for biomarkers, um, perhaps because of the um, robust efficacy signal with the antibody drug conjugate uh, uh, together. Um, you may not need much of a biomarker other than HER2. Yeah, and I, 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 Mark makes a good point, even though we don't have a superstar biomarker, knowing that the tumor is HER2 driven, whether that be by immunohistochemistry or by fish, especially in a patient who perhaps hasn't had the what we would expect benefit from trastuzumab, it's probably worth re-examining the tumor prior to starting TDM1. I think that that's one of the teaching messages that I'm trying to teach my fellows is that this is a, a, a targeted agent against HER2 and HER2 needs to be present. So if something in the patient's clinical history suggests they haven't really derived much benefit from trastuzumab-based regimens, maybe relapsing an adjuvant trastuzumab setting, maybe progressing very quickly, in the metastatic setting, those are the patients we really need to be thinking about standard of care, HER2 retesting, to really uh, make it certain that TDM1 is the appropriate next step for trastuzumab refractory And patients. so let me ask you a question. So that raises some interesting questions that are a little bit off topic here, but I think still really interesting to discuss because they're questions that many oncologists have every day. Um, one of them is, so you want to retest for HER2 in someone who has metastatic disease that's progressing. So what do you test? Yeah, are you testing the original? <laughs> right, the original tumor? Archive no. Tumor no. Metastasis? Or... Metastasis. If so, which one? Um, well, so the one that the poses assessment. the least risk um, during the biopsy, the least um, burden to the patient, but it obviously also has a, a chance of getting you meaningful tissue. So um, we don't go chasing five millimeter lung nodules just because the pulmonologist thinks it's safe. Um, so our experience has been, in particular, liver, uh, mediastinal lymph nodes. Um, bone is a reasonable thing to do, given the fish testing. Um, if you have a, a, a sizable lesion that you know you can do directed uh, targeted biopsy on, that then, then we'll go after a bone lesion as well. But if you had a positive, a tumor that was very positive, and it recurs, and you get a scant biopsy from bone or liver, and it's negative, the question is whether you believe that, which I think is, is difficult, even with fish, because sometimes you get these really, you know, biopsies where you can tell it's tumor on FNA, but the core has, you know, like three cells in it. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I've tried to stay away from the term positive, because I saw a patient in clinic yesterday whose HER2 was one plus, but her fish ratio was, you know, four. So clearly there's a disconnect in about, we know, 10 to 12% of patients. And so I think you have to use the clinical biopsy information in the context of what the, the patient's tumor has responded to and what it hasn't. So let me ask you a question, because again, let's think even further outside the box. Instead of doing HER2, what about doing intrinsic subtyping for HER2 on the specimen? So in other words, not looking at the actual fish ratio or the IHC, but actually looking at activation of HER2 in the cell by all the downstream genes. You're looking at RNA expression. Right, RNA yeah. expression Which of downstream HER2 positive marker. genes. Well, by some, existing technologies that we have already. I mean, we have them. Not all HER2 amplified tumors fall within the ERB2 intrinsic uh, gene expression phenotype. So you have to be very careful trying to make that substitution because you'll be wrong a percentage of the time. Well, the converse is also true. There are some cases that are in the HER2 transcript phenotype uh, that don't have the HER2 alteration based on gene amplification or protein overexpression, and yet they have that same transcript profile. So I think it would be hazardous to make that substitution yeah. with... Uh, right.